Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to start out with our feature tonight, Snooty, the oldest Florida manatee in captivity who died recently at the age of 69. And it sounds to me like Snooty was the victim of a party going horribly wrong because he died not long after his 69th birthday party. Here is Channel 4 Television in Miami on the death of Snooty. Bad news. Snooty, the manatee, has died in what the South Florida Museum says was simply a heartbreaking accident. The manatee drowned after being trapped by a hatch door, which is normally bolted shut. This came two days after his 69th birthday. Snooty was the oldest manatee in captivity and was believed to be the oldest on record. According to the museum, which houses the Parker Manatee Aquarium in Bradenton, an investigation is ongoing to determine how the hatch door opened. According to the South Florida Museum, Snooty was found in an underwater area used only to access plumbing for the exhibit life support system. Early indications are that an access panel door that is normally bolted shut had somehow been knocked loose and that Snooty was able to swim in, the museum said in a press release. Snooty's habitat undergoes a daily visual inspection and there were no indications the previous day that there was anything amiss. Bradenton Museum says staffers are devastated and that the circumstances are being investigated. The other three manatees undergoing rehabilitation in Snooty's habitat are all fine. The aquarium will remain closed while staff continues its investigation and to give other staff time to grieve. Snooty had previously been in good health, eating about 80 pounds of lettuce and vegetables every day to sustain his 1,000-pound body. He loved to greet his visitors and ham it up for the cameras. On Saturday, he devoured a tiered fruit and vegetable cake as thousands of guests attended his birthday bash. The museum said Snooty was born in 1948 at the Miami Aquarium and Tackle Company, calling it the first recorded birth of a manatee in human care. He moved to Bradenton in 1949, greeting more than a million visitors in his lifetime. Fans left heartfelt messages Sunday on a Facebook page dedicated to Snooty. Snooty was such a unique animal and he had so much personality that people couldn't help but be drawn to him, said Bren Ann Bessio, the museum CEO. Over the years, some have alleged that Snooty had been replaced by younger manatees, but museum officials laugh at such tales. Snooty and many other manatees were identified by unique scars from boat propellers. Snooty had two scars on his side from abscesses that were removed over 30 years ago. The museum said Snooty helped educate the public about manatees, participating in scientific research programs to help understand things like manatee hearing and vocalization. You also hosted other manatees that were being rehabilitated for return to the wild. Sounds to me like somebody ought to undergo the propeller for this one. We're going to move on now to Chester Bennington, who died recently at the age of 41. He was the lead singer and the front man for the band Lincoln Park. Came out of the Valley of the Sun in Phoenix, had a very hard life as a boy. He was with Lincoln Park since 1999. He also did some time with Stone Temple Pilots. And those of you who listen to this program know it's not my type of music, but he did have a quite versatile voice. He sang about the pain of his childhood. And Lincoln Park sold over 35 million records worldwide. When you sell that many, you got to be doing something right. Didn't like most of their heavier stuff, but they released this song called One More Light on their last album before he died. And it's pretty good. And he does a fine job with the vocal. Should have stayed were the signs I ignore. Cannot help you not to hurt anymore. We saw brilliance when the world was asleep. The song was written by a British songwriter named Francis Egg White. It was about a friend of his who died of cancer. Lincoln Park dedicated the song to Chris Cornell, who was a friend of Chester Bennington's, and he was the lead singer for Soundgarden. He committed suicide about two months before Chester Bennington also took his own life. So that song has a particular poignancy about it. But we're going to move on now to John Hurt, who died recently at the age of 72. That's not John Hurt. We did his podcast a couple of weeks back. John Hurt was an excellent actor as well. Maybe not on the caliber of John Hurt, but still very good. He was in some big movies. He was in Big, in fact, with Tom Hanks. And he was in Awakenings with Robin Williams, who was also excellent in television. He was on The Sopranos, Law & Order, Entourage. He usually played a straight-laced suburban type, or 
your sleazy white collar criminal. But somewhat to his chagrin, John Hurd will always be known for one role. Kevin, you spent $967 on That's right, John Hurd was Peter McAllister, Macaulay Culkin's father in Home Alone and the sequel Home Alone 2, filmed about two miles from here in Winnetka, guy might add. He did a wonderful job playing opposite Catherine O'Hara, but somehow I think it always prevented him from getting some of the roles that he deserved. I do want to talk about one role that John Hurd was in, it was unquestionably his best and his favorite as well. Several years before Home Alone, he played Alex Cutter in an art movie called Cutter and Bone that was renamed Cutter's Way. Virtually nobody saw this movie, but John Hurd gave an Academy Award worthy performance and he wasn't even nominated. He played a long haired, crippled, one eyed Vietnam veteran whose best friend was Jeff Bridges when Jeff Bridges was just learning how to act. Jeff Bridges stumbles upon a murder of a young girl by a wealthy Southern California oil man who the two try and blackmail with tragic consequences. Here is a little bit of one of the most underrated performances you would ever see in movies. Hold up, I'll get a drink. I don't drink. You know, the routine grind uh, drives me to drink. Tragedy, I take straight. Score one for you, Alex. You've been watching too many Babe Ruth movies, George. It's kind of a funny ad, wouldn't you say? Like the kind the gas station attendant said the guy with the Jeep cans wore. Or you think Cork killed Bo? I know he did. But so do you. That's a blackmail letter. It's a letter. A crock. Jesus, I win the prize. Alexander Cutter underestimates the rich. I was one. <laughs> it's simple, Rich. It's real easy. Your picture was in the paper, remember? Page one. He knew who you were from the first, and not only you, but me, Valerie, and Mo. You think we haven't been watched? He may be scared, but he's smart and powerful. Yeah, he had your baptism papers from the first half hour. A list of your friends. He never had to deliver any blackmail letter. All you had to do was go to the court building. Tori, I do. It's not a question what I'm going to do. It's a question what you're going to do with the time you got left. They weren't after Mo. They were after you. He just didn't see you leave. Another one of those movies that if you ever get a chance, see Cutter's Way. You will see an absolutely riveting performance by John Hurd, almost the diametric opposite of Peter McAllister. John Hurd is one of those guys who should have gotten a couple of Academy Award nominations and maybe even an award, but it didn't work out for him. I don't think he liked to play the Hollywood game, and maybe he took the wrong scripts on top of it. Just bad luck. We're going to move on now to John Cunliffe, who died recently at the age of 101, one of the great coaches in NBA history. He won five titles in six years with the Lakers, but not the Los Angeles Lakers, the Minneapolis Lakers, the best team of the late 40s and early 50s in the NBA, long before Kobe and Shaq and Showtime. But he did have three superstars, Jim Pollard, Vern Mickelson, and the greatest superstar of the early 50s, George Mikan from DePaul. As I said, he won five championships in six years. The only year he didn't win was when Mikan broke his ankle. And here is three superstars talk about his coaching. Coach Johnny Kunla, the man who's guided the Lakers to those five world championships. We had true superstars in our team. And I give Johnny Kunla all the credit in the world. All the X's and O's and marvelous plays and diagrams, that's not the toughest part of coaching any team. It's how do you get those five guys to play together. And John Kunla handled that so beautifully. We had a great team. We played as a team. Johnny Kunla would start the year off by saying, you're going to have to sacrifice for the team. And we try to do that. I never knew John to play favor. He didn't say George can do this, but you can't. He expected you to hustle and try every time you play. Objective with him was the same with us, and that was the win. And the curtain comes down on the NBA season with the jubilant Minneapolis Lakers celebrating five championships in six seasons. He was a great coach and a great man and a great friend. Here's a little bit of John Cunliffe at the end of his life reflecting on basketball. I don't even remember what one game, about a minute left to go in the tie game, I substituted, substituted, shot the beautiful basket, we won the ball game. Everybody clapped. What a smart move you made. What had happened though, the player came to me and I wanted to go to the bathroom, so I put him in the bathroom. And I put the substitute in, and I got the credit for being smart. When they asked me to take the Minneapolis Lakers over, I turned them down because I thought, we're too, too much of a gopher town. George Mike interviewed me. He was the first man to go to the Hall of Fame. They got him, and then I decided I'll go with the Lakers. Mike just really set the rule. He's had to play, throw the ball 
to make it deeper to pivot, make him think here and shoot a left-hander, or just the opposite, get him a run. That play was the, our best play, J.G., Jim and George. If I can see, if they throw the ball to me, keep away from me. Pollard said the same thing. Jim Pollard, George Mikan, and Mickelson, the big three of the Minneapolis Lakers. Pollard was, was the most graceful player I've ever seen. We could really run and jump. He's really proud of his defense. He, he really had a lot of talent. The two to worked together perfect. It's a shooting game now. It's a different game than we played. We shot uh, 200 set shots. They still do, but uh, I don't know it's a little different. Practice so much, you can get higher arch or something. But they shouldn't shoot too quick. That, that's bad. Get it in hurry up. Take your time and wait till you got a chance. Chance for a rebound. If nobody's underneath the basket. Wait, wait for the rebounders. Chance to get the rebound. The jubilant Minneapolis Lakers celebrating their fourth national championship in five seasons. Is there anything we should know about those great Lakers teams that won the championships in Minneapolis that maybe people forget? You have to have the players. I mean, that's the secret. Lucky to get a bunch of good players. Mike and Nicholson, Pollard, they gel together. That has the main thing. One of the players in practice told him, if you two play together, nobody's going to beat us. They did. John Conlon, pretty much forgotten today, but one of the great all-time coaches in basketball. We're going to close tonight with Bob Wolf, who died recently at the age of 96. He was a longtime sportscaster, and when I say longtime, I mean it. He broadcast sports for 75 years. He's the only person to broadcast championship games in each of the four major American sports, baseball, football, hockey, and basketball. Broadcast for the Washington Centers for a long time, but I think his greatest accomplishment is he was at the microphone for two of the most important and famous games in American sports history. One was the 1958 championship game between the New York Giants and Baltimore Colts that went into overtime. Here he is calling the winning touchdown by the Colts' Alan Amici in overtime. United gives to Amici. The Colts win the world champion. Amici scores. Many people say that was the game that helped make the NFL what it is today. But I think even more importantly, Bob Wolf was also at the microphone for Don Larson's perfect game in Game 5 of the 1956 World Series. Here he is calling the final pitch where Larson gets pinch hitter Dale Mitchell on a check swing third strike. Here comes the pitch. Straight through. Another home. Perfect game for Don Larson. Yogi Berra. Let's well, a no-hitter in the World Series was a big deal, and Bob Wolf was once interviewed about his call of the late innings of that game and trying not to jinx Larson's perfect game by mentioning that he had a no-hitter. Red, and some years before that, I had heard Red Barber called the Cookie Lavagetto game, and Red Barber, who was one of the all-time greats, kept saying no-hitter and so forth, and he said, the no-hit so far, and then Cookie Lavagetto swung, and Red said, and here's the tying run, and here's the winning run. As the game was over, it was lost 3-2. to two. Not only the game, the no-hitter, everything went out the window. And he had such mail coming in, particularly addressed to the sponsors, the Gillette Safety Razor Company, that in the back of my mind I said, if the time ever came when I was going to do the possibility, I would use every synonym in the book. <clears throat> so I had 21 up, 21 down. The only runners on base so far have been the Yankees, on and on. So everybody <laughs> knew the story, but I avoided the words no-hitter until the climax that I had a no-hitter, a perfect game. So it went pretty well across the country and around the world, and I, I guess I made the right decision. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps, and as a final tribute to Bob Wolf, we had to have a Wolf song. I was torn between Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf and this one, and I decided to be a little more hip with this one. So as a final tribute to Bob Wolf, here is Duran Duran with Hungry Like the Wolf. It's hungry like the wolf.